So just before I tell you how we will organize uh, the debate, let me first of all just introduce to you our two uh, debaters. Uh, on my near right, uh, William Lane Craig is research professor of philosophy at Talbot School of Theology in La Mirada, California. He did a PhD at the University of Birmingham here in England before taking a doctorate in theology from the University of Munich. Um, he's a popular international lecturer on university campuses and has authored and edited uh, well over 30 books, um, including his uh, uh, particular book, uh, Reasonable Faith. And um, he is a well-known uh, debater on these topics. Peter Atkins is a chemist, British, and uh, a former professor of chemistry at the University of Oxford and is a fellow of Lincoln College. He is a prolific writer, particularly of chemistry textbooks. Uh, his book on physical chemistry uh, was first published in 1978, and my estimate is that even in this university, uh, several thousand students have been taught physical chemistry through that uh, medium, some even perhaps in this audience. But uh, Peter Atkins is also the author of a number of science books for the general public, uh, but is also a well-known atheist. He's spoken and written on issues of humanism, atheism, and the incompatibility of science and religion. So those, ladies and gentlemen, are our two speakers for today. And the way in which we are going to organize the formal part of the debate is as follows. There will be opening presentations by both speakers of 20 minutes. There then will be the first rebuttal by each speaker, and those in turn will be 12 minutes. There will then be the second rebuttal by each speaker, which will be eight minutes, and then we will have closing statements of five minutes. Now, the only thing which I have to do is to ensure that neither of the two gentlemen speaks out of turn, so that will be fine, and that neither of them exceeds by one teeny quotient of time the allotted period. And so we will, um, after even a second or two of overtime, uh, remove them from the podium. So <laughs> the first speaker who will start is Professor Craig. Thank you very much. Let me begin by saying how grateful I am for the invitation to participate in tonight's debate and for Professor Atkins' willingness to join me on the uh, dais. During the years that Jan and I lived in England while I was pursuing my doctoral studies at the University of Birmingham, we came to have a warm affection for this country and her people, and I consider it a real joy and a delight to be here with you tonight. Thank you very much for coming. Now in tonight's debate, I'm going to defend two basic contentions. First, there are good reasons to think that theism is true. And secondly, there are not comparably good reasons to think that atheism is true. Now I'll leave it up to Dr. Atkins to present his arguments for atheism before I respond to them. In this opening speech, I want to sketch briefly three lines of evidence that weigh in favor of God's existence. As a professional philosopher, I think that God makes sense of a wide range of the data of human experience, including philosophical, scientific, moral, and historical considerations. Number one, then, the origin of the universe. Have you ever asked yourself where the universe came from? Why anything at all exists rather than nothing? Did the universe have a beginning? Or does it just go back and back forever? Typically, atheists have said that the universe is just eternal and uncaused. But there are good reasons, both philosophical and scientific, to call into question that assumption. Philosophically, the idea of an infinite past is very problematic. If the universe never had a beginning, that means that the number of past events in the history of the universe is infinite. 
but the real existence of an actually infinite number of things leads to metaphysical absurdities. To give just one example, suppose you had an actually infinite number of coins numbered one, two, three, and so on to infinity. And suppose I took away all the odd-numbered coins. How many coins would you have left? Well, you'd still have all the even-numbered coins or an infinity of coins. So infinity minus infinity is infinity. But now suppose instead that I took away all the coins numbered greater than three. Now how many coins would you have left? Three. So infinity minus infinity is three. In each case, I took away an identical number of coins from an identical number of coins and came up with contradictory results. In fact, you can subtract infinity from infinity and get any result from zero to infinity. For this reason, inverse operations like subtraction and division are simply prohibited in transfinite arithmetic. But in the real world in which we live, such a convention has no sway. Obviously, you can give away any coins that you want. Here's another example of the absurdity of an infinite past. Take the planets Jupiter and Saturn. Suppose that for every orbit that Saturn completes around the sun, Jupiter completes two. If Saturn has completed 10 orbits, Jupiter has completed 20. If Saturn has completed a trillion, Jupiter has completed two trillion. The longer they orbit, the further Saturn falls behind. If they continue to orbit forever, then they will approach a limit at which Saturn will be infinitely far behind Jupiter. But now turn the story around. Suppose that Jupiter and Saturn have been orbiting the sun from eternity past. Now which will have uh, completed the most number of orbits? The correct mathematical answer is that the number of their orbits is identical. But that seems absurd. For the longer they orbit, the further the disparity between them grows. So how does the number of their orbits magically become identical just by making them orbit from eternity past? These and many other examples suggest that infinity is just an idea in your mind, not something that exists in reality. But that entails that since past events are not just ideas in your mind, but are real, the number of past events must be finite. Therefore, the series of past events can't go back and back forever. Rather, the universe must have begun to exist. This purely philosophical conclusion has been confirmed by remarkable discoveries in astronomy and astrophysics. We now have pretty strong evidence that the universe is not eternal in the past, but had an absolute beginning a finite time ago. In 2003, Arvin Bord, Alan Guth, and Alexander Vilenkin were able to prove that any universe which is on average in a state of cosmic expansion cannot be infinite in the past, but must have a past space-time boundary. What makes their proof so powerful is that it holds regardless of the physical description of the early universe. Because we don't yet have a quantum theory of gravity, we can't yet provide a physical description of the first split second of the universe. But the bord guth vilenkin theorem holds independently of any physical description of that moment. Their theorem implies that the quantum state of the early universe, the quantum vacuum state, that is to say, which some scientific popularizers have misleadingly and inaccurately characterized as nothing, cannot be eternal in the past, but must have an absolute beginning. Even if our universe is just a tiny part of a wider multiverse composed of many universes, their theorem implies that the multiverse itself must have a beginning. 
Now, of course, highly speculative scenarios, such as loop quantum gravity models, string models, even closed time-like curves have been suggested to try to avoid this absolute beginning. Although all of these models are fraught with problems, the bottom line is that none of these theories, even if true, succeeds in restoring an eternal past. At the very most, they just push the beginning back a step. But then the inevitable question arises, why did the universe come into being? What brought the universe into existence? Some intrepid atheists have asserted that the universe just popped into being uncaused out of nothing. But surely that's metaphysically impossible. First, Professor Atkins himself points out nothingness or non-being has no properties, no powers, no potentialities. It therefore cannot produce anything. Moreover, if something could come into being out of nothing, then it's inexplicable why just anything and everything doesn't come into being from nothing. Why is it only universes that pop into being out of nothing? What makes nothingness so discriminatory? Finally, the idea that the universe could come into being from nothing is, in the words of philosopher of science, Bernhard Kanitscheider, in head-on collision with the most successful ontological commitment in the history of science, namely the principle that out of nothing, nothing comes. So, why does the universe exist instead of just nothing? Where did it come from? There must have been a transcendent cause which brought the universe into being. We can summarize our argument thus far as follows. Premise one, the universe began to exist. Two, if the universe began to exist, then the universe has a transcendent cause, from which it follows logically, therefore the universe has a transcendent cause. Given the truth of the two premises, the conclusion necessarily follows. Now, from the very nature of the case, this cause must be an uncaused, changeless, timeless, and immaterial being which created the universe. It must be uncaused because we've seen there cannot be an infinite regress of causes. It must be timeless and therefore changeless, at least without the universe, because it created time. Because it also created space, it must transcend space as well and therefore be immaterial, not physical. Now, there are only two possible candidates that could fit such a description. Either an abstract object like a number or else an unembodied mind or consciousness. But abstract objects don't stand in causal relations. The number seven, for example, can't cause anything. And therefore it follows logically that the transcendent cause of the universe is an unembodied mind. And thus we are brought not merely to a first uncaused cause of the universe, but to its personal creator. Number two, objective moral values and duties in the world. Our first argument gives us a transcendent personal creator of the universe, but it doesn't tell us anything about his moral character. How can we know that he is good? My second argument addresses that question. Premise one states, if God does not exist, then objective moral values and duties do not exist. Now by objective moral values, I mean moral values which are valid and binding independently of whether po people believe in them or not. Many theists and atheists agree that if God does not exist, then moral values and duties are not objective in this sense. For example, Michael Roos, an agnostic philosopher of science, writes, morality is a biological adaptation, no less than our hands and feet and teeth, 
considered as a rationally justifiable set of claims about an objective something, ethics is illusory. Morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction, and any deeper meaning is illusory. On a naturalistic view, moral values are just the byproduct of biological evolution and social conditioning, just as a troop of baboons exhibit cooperative and even altruistic behavior because natural selection has determined it to be advantageous in the struggle for survival, so their primate cousins, Homo sapiens, have evolved a similar pattern of behavior for exactly the same reason. There is a sort of herd morality which functions well in the perpetuation of our species. But on the atheistic view, there doesn't seem to be anything to make this morality objectively binding and true. Certain actions, such as uh, rape, may not be socially advantageous. And so in the course of human development, they've become taboo in civilized society. But that does absolutely nothing to prove that rape is wrong. Such behavior goes on all the time in the animal kingdom. Given atheism, the rapist who chooses to flout the herd morality is doing nothing more seriously than acting unfashionably. Uh, the moral equivalent, if you will, of Lady Gaga, uh, out of step with the herd. This leads to our second premise. But objective moral values and duties do exist. In moral experience, we apprehend a realm of moral values and duties that impose themselves upon us. As philosopher Louise Anthony so nicely puts it, any argument for moral skepticism is going to be based upon premises which are less obvious than the reality of objective moral values themselves, and therefore it will never be rational to accept moral skepticism. Actions like rape, cruelty, racial hatred, and child abuse aren't just socially unacceptable behavior. They're truly evil. Michael Roos himself admits, and I quote, the man who says it is morally acceptable to rape little children is just as mistaken as the man who says two plus two equals five. Some things, at least, are really evil. But if that is the case, then it follows logically and inescapably that three, therefore, God exists. Some people think that the evil in the world disproves God. I think that the exact opposite is true. Real evil in the world actually proves the existence of God, since without God, to ground objective moral values, good and evil as such would not exist. Number three, the historical facts concerning Jesus of Nazareth. Our case so far gives us a generic monotheism affirmed by Jews, Christians, Muslims, and deists alike. But do we know anything more about who this God is? To answer that question, we must look at the person of Jesus of Nazareth. The historical person, Jesus of Nazareth, was by all accounts a remarkable person. Historians have reached something of a consensus that Jesus came on the scene with an unprecedented sense of divine authority, the authority to stand and speak in God's place. He claimed that in himself the kingdom of God had come, and as visible demonstrations of this fact, he carried out a ministry of miracle working and exorcisms. But the supreme confirmation of his claim was his resurrection from the dead. If Jesus really did rise from the dead, then it would seem that we have a divine miracle on our hands and thus evidence for the existence of God. Now, most people probably think that the resurrection of Jesus is something you just believe in by faith or not. But there are actually three facts recognized by the majority of New Testament historians today, which I believe are best explained by the resurrection of Jesus. Fact number one, on the Sunday after his crucifixion, Jesus' tomb was found empty by a group of his women followers. According to Jakob Kramer, an Austrian specialist, by far most scholars hold firmly 
to the reliability of the biblical statements about the empty tomb. Fact number two, on separate occasions, different individuals and groups of people experienced appearances of Jesus alive after his death. According to the prominent New Testament critic, Gerald Ludemann, it may be taken as historically certain that the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. These appearances were witnessed not only by believers, but also by skeptics, unbelievers, and even enemies. Fact number three, the original disciples suddenly came to believe in the resurrection of Jesus despite every predisposition to the contrary. Jews had no belief in a defeated and dying Messiah, and Jewish beliefs about the afterlife precluded anyone's rising from the dead to glory and immortality before the end of the world. Nevertheless, the disciples came to believe so strongly that God had raised Jesus from the dead that they were willing to die for the truth of that belief. N.T. Wright, an eminent New Testament scholar, concludes, that is why, as a historian, I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb behind him. Attempts to explain away these three great facts, like the disciples stole the body or Jesus wasn't really dead, have been universally rejected by contemporary scholarship. The simple fact is that there just is no plausible naturalistic explanation of these facts. And therefore, it seems to me, the Christian is amply justified in believing that Jesus rose from the dead and therefore was who he claimed to be. But that entails that God exists. And thus we have a good inductive argument for the existence of God based on the resurrection of Jesus. In summary then, I've presented a cumulative case based on the origin of the universe, the existence of objective moral values and duties in the world, and the historical facts concerning the resurrection of Jesus for thinking that the God of Israel, the God revealed by Jesus of Nazareth, actually exists. Now, if Dr. Atkins wants to um, have us believe atheism instead, then what he needs to do is first to tear down all three of the arguments that I presented and then in their place erect a case of his own to prove that God does not exist. Unless and until he does that, I think we should agree that theism is the more plausible worldview. Thank you, Professor Craig. Can I ask Professor Atkins now to give his opening presentation? Thank you. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here. My immediate task, of course, is uh, to set up my stall, not to respond to Dr. Craig's arguments at this stage. That will come later, although, as you will see, some of my remarks now will in fact touch upon what he has just raised. In fact, my task is to bring you forward from the 11th century, where you've been immersed with considerable erudition for the past 20 minutes, and bring you into the 21st century and to present arguments based on a thousand years of increasing knowledge about the world. Um, Dr. Craig would have been a wonderful medieval apologist, and it's a pleasure to hear his erudite um, reprise, with a few elaborations, of course, of what have, could have been said a, a thousand years ago. Um, I do not say that scornfully. Um, Dr. Craig has touched on arguments that have long troubled thinkers, believers, and, non and disbelievers alike, and their longevity underlines their importance to mankind. But first, an admission. I cannot prove that God does not exist. Everything there is could be the creation of an extraordinary entity that surpasses our understanding. It could be that the universe was created only a millisecond ago, with all our memories suddenly but falsely in place. 
It could be, as God is outside time, whatever that mean, this phrase means, that he hasn't decided even to make us yet. It's just conceivable that, that God did indeed create the universe 13.7 billion years ago. I cannot prove that he did not. All I can do is to assemble evidence that leads to the conclusion that God is not necessary for any aspect of the current world and that there is a far simpler explanation for everything than the assertion of the existence of an omnipotent God. I have to say, of course, that many hold that the assertion that God made it is far, far simpler as an explanation of everything than a more pedestrian account in terms of physical laws. God, they say, is surely a simpler explanation than complex mechanism. Don't be seduced. The assertion that God did anything is simplistic rather than simple. And it is lazy. It is simplistic because an entity as functionally unbounded as a god must be of extraordinary complexity. It is lazy because it avoids becoming involved in untangling the web of events that have led us led to us. Any argument that simply asserts that God did it is a sign of a lazy mind, a mind that is content to wallow in assertion rather than embark upon climbing the intellectual Everest of comprehension. My argument against God is that there is nothing in the universe that cannot be explained, in prospect at least, without invoking that complex hypothesis. In other words, there are simpler explanations, or at least the prospect of simpler explanations, for absolutely everything. Because there are simpler explanations, or the prospect of them, there is no need to burden our understanding with the assertion that there is something more, namely an incomprehensible God. That billions of people believe to the contrary is of no consequence. Truth is not arrived at by a majority vote. There are clearly huge psychological and cultural pressures imposed on people from an early age and belief has been honed by the powerful into a potent weapon of crowd control. In the nasty, brutish brevity of an impoverished life, great comfort comes from the belief that there is better to come. There is also satisfaction that wrongdoers, wealthy perhaps on earth, will get their comeuppance in the afterlife. Even the meek are in with a chance. Angst and hope Angst at the prospect of, one, of one's own annihilation and hope for unbounded, unbounded es ecstasy to come are potent drivers into the jaws of belief. But the potency of the drivers and the huge majority of the hoopers does not mean that the belief is correct. I've made a strong but carefully worded claim that there is nothing in the universe that cannot be explained or has the prospect of being explained without invoking a God. I mean, I need to justify that claim. If you accept my argument that a God is unnecessary, then your only recourse, if you insist on believing that there is a God, is to admit that you are driven by your heart rather, rather than your head. But hearts are unreliable organs of knowledge. I shall deal with six points. Contingency, fitness, purpose, miracles, including resurrections, theodicy, and morality. Obviously, and perhaps mercifully, I don't have time to go be thorough on any of these topics, but perhaps by setting out the ground we can turn to finer arguments later. In each case, I shall argue that modern science, the agent of the new enlightenment, promises I can offer no more than that to elucidate what theology has long obscured. First contingency. Science currently doesn't have the slightest clue about how a universe can come into existence out of absolutely nothing without intervention. I will leave aside 
whether the universal is eternal in some sense and without a beginning. Um, that's something to be determined by observation, not by the ruminations of philosophy. We simply don't know. To make it harder for myself, I shall suppose for the sake of argument that there was a beginning. But there are two kinds of beginning, and it's important to distinguish them. One type of beginning is when an already existing universe gives rise to a daughter universe. Another type of a beginning is when absolutely nothing turns into a universe. I should call that latter universe an original universe. Now, as you've just heard, some assert that a universe can spring from a quantum fluctuation. That may be true of a daughter universe, for an already existing mother universe has physical laws and a richly propertied vacuum. But when there is absolutely nothing, there are no physical laws, no quantum fluctuation. It's, it's an empty term for the emergence of an original universe. And to make things harder for myself, but with an eye on trying to answer and not evade a deeply important question, I shall set aside the simpler problem of a daughter universe and consider the formation of an original universe. Did that original universe, although perhaps contingent, have to be caused? You have to realize that physical laws, which are summaries of observed behavior, come into existence as a universe comes into existence. That includes issues of causality. It is naive in the extreme to extrapolate our own experience of causality, which is essentially the working out of the consequences of physical laws, to an era before those laws existed. It is entirely possible that the unique event that marked the inception of the physical laws was itself an uncaused event. And what science has to do, in due course, is to discover how absolutely nothing can tumble into being and become apparently something. Is there any reason to believe that it might succeed? There's no doubt that it's actually edging towards that goal by burrowing back in time to discover that there was what there was immediately after the creation event. Look how far it has come in the past 100 years. We are starting to be confident about what first appeared, and we are certainly becoming aware of what needs to be known, such as refinements and perhaps replacements of general relativity and quantum theory. Once we know the nature of the newly formed universe, we can begin to speculate, as some actually already have, about the nature of the events that has given us the impression that there is something here in place of absolutely nothing. To, see, to say that we now have any knowledge at all about how it could happen would be a lie. But to say at this stage, and after so much progress, that God did it, would be a premature admission of defeat. There is currently no need for a creator God. Secondly, fitness. One role of God, it is argued, is to choose the values of the fundamental constants so that we images of him can emerge. I will discount the evidence that God has an apparently greater interest in ensuring the presence of gas and rocks rather than organisms and concede the fact that this universe has properties that allow for the emergence of life. There are two principal arguments that throw into doubt that a thoughtful God was involved in the design of the universe. First, it could be the case that only a certain mix of fundamental constants could come into existence for a viable universe. And the fact that they allow life is just a happy accident. Second, it could be the case, and theoretical models give some credence to it, that ours is not the only universe. And if there is more than one universe, then there is no obvious reason why there is not an infinite number of universes. Why stop at two? Why stop at 42? 
It could be that all those universes have the same mix of fundamental constants, each one allowing life. Or it could be that the fundamental constants take random values, and it is inevitable that one, or even an infinity of them, permit the emergence of life. No design appears to be necessary, and an argument that posits an essential designer god is lazy rather than convincing. There is currently no need for a designer god. Thirdly, purpose. Philosoph philosophers and their obfuscating cousins, the theologians, has puzzled for centuries over the purpose of the universe. Why did God make it? Boredom with absolutely nothing? Anxious for admirers? Keen that we should have the pleasures and the pains of existence? The trouble is, there is absolutely no evidence that the universe has any purpose whatsoever. This, like causality, is an extrapolation of puny human experience to an inappropriate cosmic scale. Each of us, of course, has purposes of various kinds, and so surely, they say, the universe has one too. Science proceeds to elu elucidate the workings of the world without invoking purpose, and finds not one jot of evidence for it. In fact, in my view, there is a grandeur in an entity as great as a universe, just hanging there, wholly without purpose. And if there is no purpose, there is no need to posit a purposeful God. Fourthly, miracles. I shall adopt the perhaps naive but common view that a miracle involves the suspension of natural law. Miracles of that kind have never, ever been observed. There is not one atom of reliable evidence that God has ever intervened in the world to suspend his laws. That the path to canonization requires physicians to certify that an event cannot be explained except by God responding to intercession by a candidate saint should result in the physicians being struck off for incompetence if they aver that a cure has no natural explanation. Even that great, pivotal, purported miracle, the resurrection, is a total fabrication, with other explanations far more cogent than anything divine. Even given that Jesus existed and was crucified, was he merely in a coma? Was his disappearance a cover-up for political reasons? Was it Golgotha Gate? Did, did the women forget which of the many post-crucifixion holes in the ground he was buried in? The Gospels are wholly unreliable, being politically motivated propaganda manifestos written long after the events they purport to report. As no miracle has ever occurred, to assert that miracles are evidence for God is an empty argument. Theodicy. That an all-loving God permits evil to stalk the world, including, most dreadfully, the unconscious evil of evolution by natural selection, has puzzled theologians since the beginning of time, and all manner of convoluted explanations have been proposed. There is, of course, an extraordinarily simple explanation. There is no all-loving God. Indeed, to anyone with an open mind, the existence of evil, the torment, accident and neighbor, visit upon the innocent, is in fact evidence against the existence of God. Morality. My sixth and final point. God is commonly presumed to be the fountainhead of love and as such, the source of the distinction between good and evil. In my view, the distinction has emerged in the course of our evolutionary history. But um, it is not, um, it's not just the um, consequence of red in tooth and claw. 
Red in tooth and claw is coated in the milk of human kindness by our emerging ability to consider the consequences of our actions. To discover the roots of ethics, we might consult the so-called holy books for a variety of anecdotes and experiences that might match our own. But to understand, to understand the source of the distinction, we need to examine our ethological history, perhaps history itself, and certainly anthropology and psychology. Just as good manners have emerged for the sake of decorum and the avoidance of offence, so good behaviour has emerged for the sake of survival. It is childish, childish to presume that there is an umpire god and adult to consider how our actions stabilise society. I've considered some of the arguments that purport to establish the existence of God and have shown that they carry little force. In every case, there is a more cogent, or at least greater, the likelihood of discovering a more cogent explanation. I can understand why the notion of God has arisen and persisted, for it provides a simple, purported explanation of great matters. It is a comfort blanket for the anxious and deprived, and it is a powerful weapon of control. You have a choice to accept, on faith alone, that there is a God, and lie back luxuriating in the foam of satisfaction. There is no longer any need to think. For why pursue the incomprehensible any further than comforting assertion? Or you can take delight in the power of the collective human intellect, an intellect that burrows into experiences, is currently in hot pursuit of comprehension on this side of the grave, and adds to life the delight of true understanding. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Atkins. And now, Professor Craig, your first opportunity for a rebuttal. You'll recall that in my opening speech, I said that I would defend two basic contentions tonight. First, that there are good reasons to think that theism is true. And secondly, that there are not comparably good reasons to think that atheism is true. Now let's turn to that second contention, that there are not comparably good reasons to think that atheism is true. In his opening speech, Dr. Atkins more or less admitted this. He said that I cannot prove that God does not exist. I can only show that God is not necessary. Well, now notice that merely leaves you with agnosticism. That is to say, the position that you don't know whether or not God exists. And that's not incompatible with the existence of God or even Christian theism. Indeed, mystic, many Christian theologians hold the position that there aren't good arguments for God's existence. I disagree with them, but nevertheless, that's consistent with a Christian position. So, at most, we're left with agnosticism. Secondly, Dr. Atkins also says that he rejects any sort of God of the gaps approach. There's nothing in the universe that cannot be scientifically explained. Now, he admits that's merely a promissory note he, he takes that by faith. But nevertheless, I want to make it very clear that I'm not postulating a sort of God of the gaps this evening to plug up holes in scientific knowledge. Rather, my claim is that science can provide evidence for a premise in an argument leading to the conclusion that God exists. For example, in my cosmological argument, there's scientific evidence for that key premise that the universe began to exist. So science does help, I think, to establish theism, not directly but indirectly by supplying evidence for a premise in a philosophical argument leading to a theological conclusion. And so I want to insist as clearly as I can that this is not a debate between science and religion tonight. On the contrary, I think that 
uh, science provides good evidence for premises in arguments that have theologically significant conclusions. Finally, he does allude very briefly to the problem of evil, saying that this makes it unlikely that God exists. Now, what Dr. Atkins seems to be saying here, although he didn't flesh out this argument, is there's some kind of an inconsistency between the statement God exists and evil exists. But the problem is those two statements are not uh, logically contradictory with each other. And therefore, the atheist must be assuming some implicit premises, some hidden assumptions that would bring out that contradiction and make it explicit. The problem is no atheist has ever been able to identify what those hidden premises are. And if Dr. Atkins knows what they are, then I will uh, ask him to please share them with us and to show us that those premises are necessarily true, because unless and until he does that, he hasn't shown any incompatibility between God and the evil in the world. Indeed, I would say that we can actually go one step further. We can actually show that God and the evil in the world are consistent. To do that, all you need to do is find a third statement that is uh, compossible or consistent with God's existence that entails that evil exists. Here's such a statement. God has morally sufficient reasons for permitting the evil in the world. As long as that is even possibly true, it shows that God and evil are logically consistent with each other. So Dr. Atkins would have to show us that it is impossible that God could have morally sufficient reasons for allowing the evil in the world. And in so doing, he will have taken on a burden of proof that is simply unsustainable by the atheist. The prominent uh, metaphysician Peter Van Inwagen says, it used to be held that evil was incompatible with the existence of God, that no possible world contained both God and evil. So far as I am able to tell, this thesis is no longer defended, not even by atheists. So we've not heard any good arguments uh, for atheism this evening. What about my arguments on behalf of theism? First, I argued that the origin of the universe points to the existence of God. I argued first that the universe began to exist, and I presented both philosophical arguments and scientific evidence in support of that premise, and Dr. Atkins doesn't deny it. Then I said, if the universe did begin to exist, then there was a transcendent cause of the universe which brought it into being. And here Dr. Atkins says, well, science can't explain how nothingness can turn into something, but he hopes that eventually it will. Now, it needs to be understood, first of all, that Professor Atkins is asking the wrong question. The question is not how nothing can turn itself into something. That is to treat nothingness as though it were something. But nothingness isn't anything. It, it has no properties, no powers, no potentialities. It, it can't turn itself into anything. The question, rather, is why did the universe come into being? Why did the universe begin to exist? Um, we're looking for a cause of the universe. And what Professor Atkins says in his um, book uh, on being is that, in fact, the universe never really began to exist because nothing exists. He says the positive and negative energy in the universe balance each other out, and thus on balance there is zero energy, and therefore really nothing exists. Not you, not me, not Professor Atkins, not the universe. Nothing exists, and therefore there's nothing to explain. Now I want to say, first of all, this is a really bad argument. Um, just because there's positive and negative energy in the universe doesn't mean that therefore there's nothing. Uh, that would be like saying uh, that if I've got 10 pounds in my wallet and I owe you 10 pounds, then in fact I've got nothing in my wallet, which is absurd. Just because on balance I, I have no financial uh, uh, statement uh, of a positive nature doesn't mean I don't have any money or that money doesn't exist. And thus Christopher Isham, who is a quantum cosmologist at Imperial <laughs> College, points out there still needs to be ontic seeding, as he puts it, to create the positive and negative energy in the first place. So this is a bad argument for nothing's existing. Secondly, I want to say, in any case, the conclusion is absurd. 
First of all, it's self-contradictory. Uh, if you say there is positive energy and there is negative energy, the is is an existential is in those statements. You're saying there exists positive energy and there exists negative energy, and that contradicts the statement that nothing exists. So the, 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 the position on its face is patently self-contradictory. Moreover, it is absurd to say that nothing exists. I at least exist, um, and I know that I exist. It's undeniable that you at least exist. I'm reminded of the story of a philosophy uh, student, a fresher, who came bursting into his philosophy professor's office early one morning, unshaven, bleary-eyed. He'd obviously been up all night. He'd been re reading Descartes, who doubted his own existence. And the student said to the professor, Professor, I've got to know, do I exist? And the professor looked at him and said, who wants to know? <laughs> at least your own existence is undeniable. Uh, and in any case, if professor, if professor Atkins is right, then nobody has really offered this objection, uh, right? Because nobody exists. So why should I bother refuting it if the objection doesn't even exist and nobody has ever raised it? So I think the conclusion is, is clearly absurd. I gave three reasons as to why something can't come into being out of nothing. First of all, as Professor Atkins recognized, nothingness has no properties, no powers, no potentiality. It's just non-being. It has no ability to produce anything. Second, if something could come from nothing, then just anything and everything could come into being from nothing. And there's, it's inexplicable why it's just universes. Why not root beer and Beethoven and bicycles? Nothingness, there's nothing about nothingness that could make it discriminatory because nothingness has no power, it's not anything. And then finally, as I say, to suggest that things come into being out of nothing would completely undermine the whole project of modern science. <clears throat> the most important principle underlying modern science is that out of nothing, nothing comes, and therefore we seek explanations. So his, his view is deeply unscientific, I think. So it follows from those premises that therefore the universe has a cause, and then I deduced philosophically some of the conclusions, or rather some of the attributes of that cause. Notice I didn't in any time postulate God to fill a gap in scientific knowledge. This is a philosophical argument offered by a metaphysician for a philosophical conclusion. Secondly, I argued that objective moral values and duties in the world point to God, and I, uh, Professor Atkins hasn't yet responded specifically to that, and we'll wait to hear his response. Thirdly, on the resurrection of Jesus, all Dr. Atkins had to say is there's absolutely no evidence of miracles. Well, I beg to differ. In the case of the resurrection of Jesus, you've got the empty tomb, the post-mortem appearances, and the origin of the Christian faith itself, and these are agreed upon by the majority of New Testament historians who have written on this subject. N.T. Wright, a very prominent British scholar in this area, says, and I quote, the empty tomb and appearances have a historical probability so high as to be virtually certain, like the death of Augustus Caesar in A.D. 14 or the fall of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. So these facts are firmly established and agreed upon. The only question is how do you best explain them? Well, here, Dr. Atkins says, maybe it was a cover-up. This is to recur to the old conspiracy theory of English deism that was offered back in the, in the 17th century, and which no contemporary scholar would defend today. To mention just a couple of problems with it, it's hugely implausible. It doesn't take seriously what a disaster the crucifixion was for the disciples. There was no expectation in Judaism of a Messiah who, instead of establishing David's throne in Jerusalem, would be defeated and humiliated by the Gentiles and killed by them. So if your favorite Messiah got himself crucified, you basically had two choices. You either went home or you got yourself a new Messiah. But in no other case did anyone say that he's risen from the dead. Secondly, it's completely anachronistic because it associates the idea of a resurrection from the dead with the Messiah. And in Judaism, those are completely separate ideas. Resurrection occurs only after the end of the world. And for that reason, and many others, the theft hypothesis and conspiracy 
is rejected by contemporary scholars. No one defends it. So I think we've got good reasons for theism, not comparably good reasons for atheism, and therefore I think theism is the more rational position. Thank you. Professor Atkin, will you present your first rebuttal, please? I'd like to um, perhaps paraphrase, uh, paraphrase a remark by the economist J.K. Galbraith, who said that astrology was invented in order to make economic forecasting look respectable. I'd like to say that theology was invented to make philosophy look respectable. You've heard nothing but obfuscation. Let me remind you, because I have to, uh, my first rebuttal refers to the first 20 minutes of um, Dr. Craig's presentation, rather than his immediate one. The, the level of argument that we heard relating to the eternal nature of the universe, it was that planets clearly have not been going round the sun an infinite number of times, I shorten the rather ludicrous argument that we actually heard. No one ever says that. He's raised a straw man. What we're really concerned about is whether the universe itself is infinite. And we can measure the life of the solar system as about five billion years. We can measure the life of the universe as 13.7 billion years. We weren't talking about that at all. We were talking about whether the sequence of universes might be infinite and that there was never actually a beginning. You cannot argue against that by philosophy. You cannot argue against that by theology. The only way you can argue about it is by looking at the evidence. And we heard no evidence whatsoever. Um, so. And arguments about infinity are always extraordinarily doubtful. I mean, Professor Craig said that an infinite number of events has never occurred in the universe. I refer him to Zeno, halving the distance, halving the distance again, never getting anywhere. But clearly, if you've got an infinite number of halving of the distances, you get anywhere you want to. So never listen to an argument about infinity. It's infinitely slippery. <laughs> the travesty of my remarks about nothing coming from nothing. Let me take that as an example. What I wanted to show is that science is circumspect in the way that it approaches the great questions of being. Okay, it looks around, and if you're a naive looker around her, a philosopher, a theologian, a gardener, a farmer, you will see a huge amount of energy in the universe and you will marvel at God's bounty. But then, as a scientist, you think again and you say, yes, I can measure the amount of energy in the universe. I won't just lie back and think about it. I will measure it because once I put numbers to, to ideas, they become testable and verifiable. And to, to determine the energy of the universe, the th first thing I do is to weigh it. So I weigh the mass, I determine the mass of a galaxy, and then I multiply it by the square of the speed of light. And through E equals mc squared, I get the energy that that galaxy represents. I do it for this galaxy, that galaxy, this galaxy. Every galaxy in the universe, not just the ones we can see. And I get a colossal value. And I lie back and wonder at God's munificence. And then I say, but I've forgotten something, which is the gravitational attraction between galaxies. And whenever you have two attracting bodies, they lower their energy. And if you take the gravitational attraction of this galaxy with that one, it lowers that first sum we got a little bit. Then this galaxy with that one, this galaxy with that one, this galaxy with that one. And the signs are, and we're not completely certain about this, because we don't, do not jump to conclusions in science. We are circumspect, imaginative, and honest. 
we find that that gravitational attraction reduces that original huge energy we had to zero. In other words, God's munificence was zero. And you don't need a God if the God isn't going to give you anything. What science does is to simplify the questions that need to be answered. It doesn't say there was nothing originally, there's nothing now. What it does is to simplify the question that needs to be asked. We're moving cautiously, imaginatively, and reliably to understanding the incipients of the universe by seeing, by identifying what questions truly have to be answered. There is nothing here, I will concede that, but it's an extremely interesting form of nothing. There was nothing originally, there is nothing here now, but it's through whatever event took place at the inception of the universe, it became an interesting form of nothing, which seems to be something. It may be metaphysical, and it may sound stupid, but what I'm doing is identifying the question that needs to be answered, not just sitting back in awe and saying, look at the universe, fantastic job, it obviously needed someone really rather special to do it. The resurrection, if I can jump forward, I do notice that Professor Craig, although I made six points, did not deal with all six. Um, perhaps I should deal with all three of his. His second, of course, was um, uh, the ob objectivity of moral values. To say that you cannot be moral without a God is frankly disgusting. I am moral, I do not believe in the, that I am guided by a God, and I think it casts a slur on atheists everywhere in the world to presume that they are evil because they believe there is no God. Um, morals, as I asserted in my opening presentation, the emergence of morals should be understood. They should not simply be accepted. You should try to find the roots of moral behavior. Hard as it is to trace the emergence of moral thinking as one's own body begins at one cell and turns into a trillion cells, as evolution proceeds through billions of years, as people begin to think about the consequences of their actions. That's the way to understand morality, not just to lie back and think that there is an umpire in the sky somewhere. Try to understand. All I'm saying is that it is healthier to understand. If Voltaire said in one of my favorite um, quotations that people who believe in absurdities commit atrocities. And I think you, we see that in religious belief where atrocities are, are, are affected in the name of, of dogma. The resurrection, I must deal with that in miracles. Of course, David Hume got it right when he said that there's always more reason to believe, to disbelieve the report than there is to believe what is reported. Look at the Gospels. You can't really believe it. Pretend we were writing about events 60 years ago when there was no actual real record. We wouldn't get it right. We'd make up a lot of it. The Gospels are political propaganda sheets, and it's inevitable and understandable that they were invented to, to make the point that they were trying to make. Yes, Joshua, if he existed, Jesus, I suppose you might call him, and I, I can well believe that in the Palestine of 2,000 years ago there were lots of Joshuas around, that uh, was probably a very nice man and was certainly written up to be a very nice man by the people compiling the Gospels to 
establish the creed that they wanted to, but the actual evidence is extremely slender. The evidence in favor of uh, an actual resu resurrection is compiled by those who start from a prejudicial point of view that it did occur and then seek to justify it. Others, those who deny the resurrection, say, oh, this is such an extraordinary event, we need real extraordinary evidence to support it. And there is no real extraordinary evidence to support it. So why should you believe it? Because you can see that it was invented as a political manifesto? No, you cannot possibly believe it. And all this gibberish about having to justify atheism. I mean, that's another example of, of false premise. If I come into a room and say, I don't understand anything, I will start from the simplest explanation and I will let you convince me that my simple explanation is inadequate. And if I can show that my explanation is inadequate, then I might begin to believe that perhaps there is indeed a God. But to say that it is my duty to dismantle someone else's belief is an incorrect and illogical approach to the particular question. I'm, I come into a room with, if you like, a barren view of the nature of the universe. And I ask you, Professor Craig, to convince me that my view is inadequate. That you have not done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Professor Craig, now for the second round of rebuttals. Thank you. Let's review those three arguments that I presented on behalf of theism in light of Professor Dawkins' critique. First, the cosmological argument. I presented philosophical and scientific evidence in support of the premise that the universe began to exist. In his last speech, I understood Professor Dawkins simply to assert that the arguments against an infinite regress are no good, but I heard no refutation of my examples that I gave to illustrate this, nor any reason as to why the reasoning was invalid. It needs to be understood here that the mathematical existence of the infinite is not in question. I'm talking about whether or not an actually infinite number of things can exist in reality. In their textbook, uh, Mathematics and the Imagination, Edward Kastner and James Newman comment with regard to the, in the infinite, its existence in any form is a matter of considerable doubt. The infinite certainly does not exist in the same sense that we say there are fish in the sea. Existence in the mathematical sense is wholly different from the existence of objects in the physical world. And I'm arguing that it's absurd metaphysically for there to be an actually infinite number of real objects, and I don't think Professor Atkins has dealt with my arguments. Secondly, with respect to the evidence for the beginning of the universe, again, he asserted there's no evidence scientifically for the beginning, but I presented the evidence in my opening speech. The bohr guth vilenkin theorem, which is independent of any physical description of the early universe, uh, requires a past space-time boundary. Here's what Alex Vilenkin himself says in his book, Many Worlds in One. He says, it is said that an argument is what convinces reasonable men, and a proof is what it takes to convince even an unreasonable man. With the proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. Now, Dr. Atkins is a reasonable man. And therefore, he should be convinced by the bohr guth vilenkin theorem and face this problem of a cosmic beginning. And in fact, as I say in his book, he does so. He argues that the way you get around the problem is by saying that nothing exists, um, that there was nothing then and there is nothing now. But I didn't hear a response 
to my refutation of that, that the argument for that based on positive and negative energy is misguided, and secondly, that the conclusion is absurd because it's self-contradictory and also because his own existence at least is undeniable. So it seems to me that we have good grounds for thinking the universe has a cause which is beginningless, uncaused, changeless, timeless, immaterial, enormously powerful and personal. With respect to the moral argument for the existence of God, I first argued that if God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. Here, uh, Professor Atkins clearly misunderstood my argument. He said, it is disgusting to assert that atheists can't live good moral lives. And of course, I would never think of saying something like that. Um, that's not the argument. What I'm saying is that if there is no God, then there is no transcendent foundation for objective, mind-independent moral values and duties. Moral values and duties are just the spin-offs of the evolutionary social project or, or, or program, and they have no objective validity. If you were to rewind the film of human evolution and shoot it anew, a very different type of creature with very different values and duties might well have evolved, and it would be guilty of speciesism to claim that our morality is objectively true rather than theirs. Richard Dawkins has said, there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. We are machines for propagating DNA. It is every living object's sole reason for being. And what I would ask Professor Atkins is why on atheism is Richard Dawkins wrong? It seems to me that on atheism he's right, and indeed reading Professor Atkins' books, I think that Professor Atkins would actually agree with this, that moral values are just the byproducts of uh, sociobiological evolution and have no objective validity. But my second premise is that objective moral values and duties do exist in moral experience we have a, apprehend a realm of objective moral values, and there's no more reason to deny their objectivity than the objectivity of the physical world around us. So if you agree with me that there are certain things that are truly evil, like racial discrimination, hatred, uh, uh, abuse of, of, of spouses, uh, rape of little children, then you will agree with me that God exists as a transcendent uh, foundation for these objective moral values. Thirdly, professor, we, I, I suggested that the evidence for Jesus' resurrection points to the existence of God and uh, shared the empty tomb, the appearances, and the origin of the Christian faith. Now, Dr. Atkins doesn't deny those facts so much as appeal to David Hume's argument against miracles to say that it's impossible to prove miracles using evidence because miracles are so improbable. I have a twofold response to this. First of all, David Hume didn't understand the probability calculus. It wasn't developed in David Hume's day. And therefore, contemporary theorists, theorists know that Hume's argument is mathematically fallacious. It is demonstrably fallacious. Uh, Peter Milliken, whom I debated earlier this week, a Hume scholar and expert admits that Hume's maxim is fallacious. It is false, he says. What Hume neglected was the crucial probability that we should have the evidence we do if the resurrection had not occurred. That is to say, what is the probability that there should be an empty tomb, post-mortem appearances, and the origin of the disciples' belief in Jesus' resurrection if there were no resurrection, if it hadn't occurred? That probability is very, very, very low. And that can offset any intrinsic improbability in the resurrection itself. So Hume simply didn't understand the probability calculus, and a contemporary scientist uh, should not appeal to David Hume to justify his skepticism concerning miracles. Secondly, why think that a resurrection is intrinsically improbable? What is improbable is that Jesus rose naturally from the dead. That is incredibly improbable, that all the cells in Jesus' body spontaneously and naturally came back to life again. I agree that's improbable, but that's not the hypothesis. The hypothesis is that God raised Jesus from the dead. And if the background information you consider can, uh, includes the cosmological and the moral arguments, 
then I don't think it's at all improbable that if God exists, he should raise Jesus of Nazareth from the dead. So there's simply no intrinsic improbability in such an event. Dr. Atkins says it's not the simplest explanation. Well, I think that's arguable, but in any case, you have to also consider explanatory power, explanatory scope, plausibility, and so forth. And when you do, I think the resurrection emerges head and shoulders above any of the far-fetched alternatives, such as the conspiracy hypothesis suggested by Professor Atkins this evening. Thank you. Professor Atkins, your second rebuttal. It was said by Dr. Craig earlier that this is not an argument between science and religion. You bet it is. It is all about evidence and what is evidence and basing your belief on evidence. There is no evidence whatsoever for any assertion that Dr. Craig has made this evening. You have to accept that everything you have heard him say can be accepted on faith and cannot be demonstrated by evidence. What I have tried to do this evening is to move, show that scientists are moving cautiously forwards on the basis of collecting evidence and being guided towards understanding. That is the difference. If you start from the position of being faithful, that is, you start from the, big, the, the view that God does exist, then of course you can explain absolutely everything. But how childish the explanations are. They are, God wanted it. God wanted Jesus to be reconstituted. God did it. God wanted the world. He could make a world. These are fairy stories. These aren't explanations. These do not lead you to understanding. These do not lead you to comprehension. These do not lead you to getting through a day and saying, I have learned something about the nature of the world. They are lazy slogans. They are not explanations. Yes, when I presented my remarks, they were based on faith. I have been accused by Dr. Craig of having a kind of faith. I don't deny that. But it is a faith that can be tested this side of the grave, rather than the faith that he professes that can be tested only on the other side of the grave. Whenever you listen to a philosopher speaking, there is always an air of pessimism. I, well, another um, remark might illustrate what I have in mind. Auguste Comte, in the middle of the 19th century, the founder of sociology, said, under no circumstances ever will we know the composition of the stars and the temperatures of their surfaces. You show me a star, I will tell you its composition, I will tell you its temperature. Philosophers say, you will never do this. Scientists say, wait, we are getting there and we're getting there reliably. My point this evening is that the questions that we are debating about the origin of the universe, the composition of the universe, which actually Dr. Craig has um, ignored in my opening remarks, the purpose of the universe, which once again Dr. Craig ignored in my presentation and has not in any sense rebutted, all those things are extraordinarily difficult questions. But science in its cautious, tortoise-like way, is edging towards finding ways to answer them. And it is edging towards them without needing to invoke a god to present, uh, to, if you'd like, to introduce a supernatural element into the discussion. So Dr. Craig's remarks were all about wizards and the supernatural. Mine were about finding 
reliable explanations that everyone can understand. I mean, think about the resurrection, if that's pivotal to this evening's um, discussion. The fact that a number of people saw Jesus after he was crucified is outweighed by the fact, perhaps, that even more people saw Elvis. But you know, was Elvis resurrected after he died? It's a well-known Elvis effect that uh, you, you're desperate to see someone that you have lost. Um, I think, as you've listened to this evening, you've seen a stark contrast between assertion, certainty that God did it, and my caution in saying, give us time on the basis of the evidence that we can succeed and are succeeding in discovering how the world works without invoking a God. There is no reason to suppose that we will not in due course get there. And that is the crucial point. As to morality, one is led by religion into dreadful corners of the world. Let me remind you of an article that appeared in The Independent last week. It touches upon Manchester. Worshippers in Manchester, perhaps you were among them, although what I'm about to say suggests that you were not. Worshippers in Manchester have stopped taking life-saving drugs after being persuaded about the healing power of God. And a BBC London investigation yesterday revealed that at least three women with HIV AIDS have died after they stopped taking medication on the advice of their pastors. Now, why did God let them die? You can see the danger that the idea of God introduces into the concept of what is right and what is wrong. The pastors were evil people to tell them to stop taking their medication and they were guided, they thought, by God. I would prefer not to be guided by that particular God. Thank you. We now move to the closing statements from each of our two uh, protagonists, uh, starting first with Professor Craig. Well, again, I want to thank Professor Atkins for participating in this stimulating debate this evening, and I hope that you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Let's draw together some of the threads of this debate in this closing speech and see if we can draw some conclusions. First, have we seen any good arguments for theism? Well, it seems to me that we certainly have. First, we had the cosmological argument based on the origin of the universe. I presented evidence, scientific and philosophical, that the universe began to exist, and that has not been refuted. I then argued that if the universe began to exist, there had to be a transcendent cause of the universe. And here, all Professor Atkins can say is that science is edging toward the answers. Ladies and gentlemen, science is not edging toward explaining how being can come out of non-being. That is a philosophical, metaphysical question, not a physical question. What science is edging toward is answering the question, did the universe have a beginning or is the universe infinite in the past? And all of the evidence that I am familiar with is on the side of the scale that said the universe is finite in the past. It is not past eternal. The board guth vilenkin theorem requires the finitude of the universe in the past. I know of no evidence whatsoever that the universe has existed from infinity. Moreover, there's nothing in science that would explain how something can come into being out of nothing. Indeed, as I showed, 
science presupposes the principle that out of nothing, nothing comes. Otherwise, the utter, uh, there would be utter chaos in the scientific enterprise. You wouldn't be able to explain anything scientifically because you could just say it came into being out of nothing. So I think we have good grounds for believing in a transcendent cause of the universe endowed with the attributes I suggested. Secondly, the moral argument has gone largely undiscussed tonight. I've argued that if God doesn't exist, then there is no transcendent standard for objective moral values and duties, and we're just lost in socio-cultural relativism. But that secondly, it is plausible that objective moral values and duties do exist. Any argument for moral skepticism will be based upon premises which are less obviously true than the existence of objective moral duties and values themselves. And therefore, we've got good grounds for believing that God exists as a foundation for objective moral values and duties. Thirdly, with respect to the resurrection, all Professor Atkins is reduced to saying now is that the appearances of Jesus are comparable to Elvis sightings. Well, it seems to me that the Elvis sightings were either lies, as is most probable, or hallucinations. But neither of those explanations is a good explanation of the resurrection appearances. The resurrection appearances were clearly not lies. I'm not aware of any Elvis sighter who has been willing to go to a tortuous death for his belief in having seen Elvis uh, risen from the dead. The resurrection appearances are not hallucinations. The diversity of the appearances, many groups and individuals, different locales, different circumstances, believers, unbelievers, skeptics alike. Secondly, it wouldn't have led to belief in Jesus' resurrection. Seeing hallucinations of Jesus would have at most led them to believe that Jesus had been assumed into heaven, but not risen from the dead, which ran contrary to Jewish beliefs. And thirdly, it leaves the empty tomb unexplained. In order to explain the empty tomb, you've got to conjoin an independent hypothesis to the hallucination hypothesis in order to explain all the data. So his explanation has inadequate explanatory scope and therefore fails as a good explanation. It's less simple than the, uh, the explanation the disciples gave that Jesus is risen from the dead. Finally, have we seen comparably good arguments for atheism tonight? I think in all honesty we'd have to say no, we have not. The problem of evil was mentioned but then dropped. Dr. Atkins has tried to cast this as a debate between science and religion. But if you've noticed, I offered arguments for my theism. He's not dealing with a preacher here, here tonight. He's dealing with a philosopher who has offered deductive arguments for theism. The only person who has appealed to faith in tonight's debate has been Dr. Atkins, who has appealed to his naturalistic scientism uh, and the omnipotence of science in explaining everything. I have not appealed to faith. Rather, I have appealed to scientific evidence for premises in arguments leading to a conclusion having theological significance. So when I weigh the evidence on both sides of the scale, it seems to me clear which way the evidence points. Thank you. Professor Atkins, your closing statement, please. Well, Dr. Craig has presented arguments that would have enthralled and convinced his audience a thousand years ago, uh, but now actually do seem very tired. His arguments really have been of three kinds. One argument is logic, but logic is a process of deducing consequences from a, an initial assertion. It has nothing to say about the validity of that assertion, and indeed adds nothing to the assertion. Of course, if it turns out that observations support the consequences, then there is reason to believe in the validity of the original assertion. But you can't proceed, as Dr. Craig attempts to do, by logic alone. It must be supported by evidence. Dr. Pr Dr. Craig presented no such evidence. The second argument is apparently scientific and boils down to the investigation of causality and the inference that there must be a first cause. This is a powerful classical argument that has survived for a thousand years, yet it is empty. 
for it is merely an extrapolation of the current properties of the universe to an era when it did not exist. And the third type of evidence is personal, involving the acceptance of unlikely, indeed impossible events, and the ascription of the springs of morality to authority, rather than seeking a deeper explanation in terms of our evolutionary and cerebral history. Dr. Craig favors anecdote over evidence and assertion over reflection. Neither seems to me to be a basis for the rest of us believing in God. I presented six arguments that there is no need for a creator God, that there is no need for a designer God, not touched in, by the opposition this evening, no need for a purposeful God, not touched by the opposition this evening, that um, there is, um, there is no evidence, there's no evidence for an all-loving God, and although we did just touch upon that, it was not rebutted, and that there is no need for an umpire God, because we can look after our own morality, thank you very much. And there is no need for an interventionist God, because there have ne there has never, ever been a miracle of any magnitude, certainly not a resurrection. Let me take you back to beyond um, Dr. Craig's favoured milieu of a thousand years ago, into a, an imagined era that did not exist, when there was no belief in God, but when science had become established and had succeeded to the point that it has today. Not all questions of great import had been answered, but enormous knowledge had been assembled about the workings of the world. Dr. Craig then enters in a blaze of glory and offers his answer to the questions that still puzzled the scientists of the day. Forget your struggles, he says. There is one very simple answer. God did it. Quite frankly, no one would have taken him seriously and would see his assertion as intellectually empty. A thousand years ago, Dr. Craig's arguments would have fallen on ready ears. Today, they also fall, regrettably, on ready ears. But they are the ears that are determined not to revise their prejudices and are fixed to brains that are too lazy to struggle with more complicated explanations. We should be enormously thankful to the religious of the past for showing that the human brain was adept at identifying and struggling with deeply important questions. But we should be enormously proud of the fact that the collective human mind, through the scientific method of collecting evidence, is now in the process of, a of, a of arriving at a deep, true understanding of all there is, and all there is does not include God. Thank you. Well, that concludes the formal part of this evening's debate. Unlike some debates, we will not take a vote. Uh, the purpose of this debate, I think, in many ways, is to give people arguments, reasons, things for them to take forward, things to work upon. And I think it's a tribute to the two of, uh, people on this platform, uh, Bill Craig and Peter Atkins, that we have had a stimulating and very, very profound debate on such an important topic. For those who have a sense of history, uh, the last time these two gentlemen debated was in 1998 in Atlanta. The title was slightly longer than the title today, but it was similar. Uh, that debate still exists on the internet, 
And what I found fascinating is to see how the arguments have developed in that sort of period. But we've had a, a, an enormously enjoyable, an enormously stimulating, and a, a very profitable evening. And can I ask you to thank our two uh, debaters uh, now, please. <laughs> Now we have but a small time remaining to us, not enough time I'm afraid to take question and answers from the hall, but we have with us Peter Williams, who may be known to some of you, he's philosopher in residence at the um, Damara Trust and also uh, is a lecturer in journalism and communication in Norway. He has experience of chairing uh, discussions and so what he is going to do in a sense is to just take a few highlights and in a more informal uh, way to discuss uh, or to ask our two people to uh, answer the questions. My suggestion is you just take the format that we've got here and we will have perhaps a quarter of an hour to, um, to talk uh, on that. So Peter, thank you. Well. Okay, we're on. Marvellous, thank you very much. We were going to move to some more comfortable chairs, but we don't have time for that. Uh, so these gentlemen will have to uh, bear with us on this one. I thought that was absolutely uh, fascinating, and particularly, I think, one issue that came across for me uh, was this whole issue of whether this was a, really a debate between uh, science and religion, or perhaps more broadly, actually, a debate between science and philosophy as approaches to how we know things, how we answer questions. Um, so, Bill, are you simply a, a pessimistic philosopher telling us what we can't know and then plugging in uh, your favored theological conclusions? I, I hope that that's clear to everyone here tonight that that's not my approach. I am an avid reader of science with an avocation uh, in cosmology I'm very, very interested in the question of the finitude of the past uh, and also in the question of the fine-tuning of the universe for intelligent life, which we haven't discussed this evening. But what I'm arguing to repeat, it's a carefully articulated claim, is that science can provide evidence for a premise in an argument leading to a conclusion having theological significance. So that premise, the universe began to exist, is a religiously neutral statement, which you can find in any textbook on astronomy and astrophysics. It is a statement to which scientific evidence is relevant. And that's all my appeal is to uh, with respect to science, not to appeal to science to prove God or use God to plug up gaps in knowledge. Okay, well, P Professor Atkins, uh, would you like to, to comment on what you think about philosophy trying to use um, science to do philosophy? Is, is that a mistake to try and answer questions in that, oh, that method that sort yeah. of... Philosophy is a big waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I will soften that on, so that I'm allowed by the occasional philosopher in the audience to, to escape with my limbs intact this evening. I think, I, th I think philosophy is quite useful in terms of moral philosophy and so on, where awkward questions are, re uh, are resolved by, by interesting arguments. Philosophy has absolutely nothing to say about the nature of the world. Uh, it's completely blind. Uh, the only way that you can make progress in understanding the workings of the world is through the scientific method. That is, going out, making observations, and fitting them into a network of a reticulation, if you like, of theories. Um, but philosophers are just, just a complete waste of time in terms of science. And, um, uh, and they're kind of a sheet anchor. Hmm. <laughs> Between these two guys. It's good job I'm sitting in the middle, I think. Um, do I get a chance to <laughs> come back you on that? You want to come back? Well, sure. I, I think that's really a naive view. The, the man who claims to have no need of philosophy 
is the one who is most apt to I be. I didn't say that, though. I didn't say that at all. I said that philosophy does not enable you to understand the workings of the world. Only science enables you to understand the workings of the world. I don't care as you philosophers reflect upon the discoveries of science, mm -hmm. but you're not going to find out anything just by sitting there thinking but, about but it. But even that is a statement of, that is a philosophical statement that you just made. No, That's a statement of, of scientific the realism. There's plenty of evidence in the past that the Greeks had about thinking about the universe. Look where it got them. Fascinating. They got them into, his, into the history books, didn't get them into the science books. It was only when Galileo came along and, and his successors, and people started to do experiments to see what the world really looked like, rather than just what it, they thought it ought to look but, like. But the in seeing what made. the world really looked like, Professor Atkins, don't you see that you are assuming a philosophical position about science, namely scientific realism? If you're an anti-realist, then you would yeah, say, well, science doesn't really see, tell us anything about the world. starting to emerge. <laughs> well, no, well, let's rephrase the question like, like this. Uh, is your position then, uh, Professor Atkins, that, that science, uh, not only, as you say in your book, is the, the only way to answer the questions about the nature of reality, but that science doesn't even need to assume anything um, philosophical in order for the scientific project itself to work, that science kind of supports itself, as it were, as a, as a project of yeah, understanding. Yeah, I absolutely think that. I, I think um, certainly the sciences give food for philosophical thought, but I don't think philosophers give much food for scientific thought. Okay, so, and would you agree that science can be a self-supporting enterprise of understanding reality? Doesn't, doesn't the very success of science, for example, uh, justify doing science? Well, now that's a different question. Justify doing science? Yes, certainly there can be a pragmatic justification. But Professor Atkins and I, I think, are both after questions of truth. Not just does science work. I mean, that is a philosophy of science namely instrumentalism or operationalism. Um, Stephen Hawking, in his recent book, The Grand Design, adopts this kind of operationalist view. He says, we develop models of reality, but they're just more or less useful. They really tell us nothing about the way the world is. Well, that's absolute nonsense, isn't it? Well, I agree, it's nonsense, but that's yeah. a philosophical <laughs> point of view. <laughs> Okay, let us, we have a, a few more issues to try and cover in the, the short amount of time that we have. Uh, so moving on from uh, matters of, uh, of science and, and epistemology to actually look at some of these uh, arguments that were, were mentioned tonight. Um, I thought one very interesting point that Professor Atkins uh, made against your uh, cosmological argument, Bill, was this point about um, you can't invoke causality in trying to explain why there is a universe, why the universe began, and so on, because causal laws depend upon there being a universe in existence, which it describes, and so you can't invoke causal laws when there is no universe being assumed. Yeah, this is a mistake in, sometimes Professor Atkins speaks as though there were a time when there was nothing including no causality, but that's philosophically incoherent. You see? <laughs> Go ahead. It, it's, it's not true that there was a time when there was nothing. The point is that time itself had a beginning yep. before which there wasn't anything. When we say there was nothing before the universe began, we don't mean there was something before it, and it was nothing. What we mean is there wasn't anything before it. The universe came into being, and the question is, does that require a transcendent cause, or can the universe just pop into being without a cause? And it seems to me that causality is a metaphysical principle, not just a sort of law of gravity or law of thermodynamics, which governs being as being, and being doesn't come from non-being. Being only comes from being. Well, presumably you would think that causality can only be a scientific principle because philosophy is not the way to go here. So you, you can only invoke causality in a scientific sense from your viewpoint, is that correct? Well, absolutely. I mean, I mean uh, philosophical arguments about there being a metaphysics before there was a universe seems to be absolute nonsense again. Um, you know, I, the answer to the inception of the universe 
will not come from sitting on our backsides and thinking about what might have happened. It will come from assembling evidence and building a model and seeing whether the model actually results in this observed universe. And when scientists have done that, philosophers will say, oh yeah, we didn't think of that. We, aren't, we see now. So philosophers will always follow where science has led. Mm, well, well, I mean, <laughs> that's so naive. I mean, that is really a naive view of science and of philosophy. Science is replete with philosophical assumptions uh, that make science possible. And as, that's why I said before, the person who thinks that he isn't doing philosophy or has no need of philosophy is the person who's going to not understand his own philosophical assumptions that he tacitly makes and, and therefore is uncritical of them. Uh, one or two last issues I think we can cover before we have to uh, start clearing the hall, unfortunately. Um, you said in your closing speech, Professor Atkins, that these uh, pastors that you mentioned who'd convinced some Christians to stop taking their medication... Uh, it wasn't in my closing speech, but oh, it was sorry. A uh, You mentioned these pastors who'd convinced people to stop taking their meditation. You said that they were, these were evil people. Yeah. But when you claim that they're evil people, I'd like to clarify, because we didn't quite get onto this point about, the, about morality. Do you mean objectively evil <laughs> or subjectively evil? I mean they're a nasty bunch <laughs> and that they shouldn't have done what they did because it ruined the lives of people that they were in power over and I regard that as a kind of evil. Right, yes, but is, is this more than something, you talked about the evolution of, of morality and then yeah. human reflection and so on, but there's nothing outside of that in, in terms of, of moral standards that you judge people's actions by, well, in your view? Yeah, I think it's objectively immoral to kill people, because I think um, what has emerged through evolution is a stable society when, on the whole, you don't kill your neighbour. I mean, if, if you'd started to, if there was a tribe where the mores were that you killed your next door neighbour every, every Thursday morning, then um, that tribe would disappear after a few weeks. Um, but uh, our, our morality has led to stability. We've got a way of living in a complex, interactive society. Aha. Uh -huh. So, Professor Craig, um, you can have objective morals uh, because it is objectively the case that behaving this way is the only way to have a stable, thriving, flourishing society. So there is an objectivity to, to morals without God? That just is to say that the herd morality that has emerged among homo sapiens is, has utility in the struggle for survival. And no one would deny that, that there, is, there are conditions under which Homo sapiens flourish if they have these kind of social interactions. Uh, but that's true also of pigs, uh, of elephants, yeah, of any we, kind we of... We can also think about the consequences of actions, and that's the difference. It's not just red and tooth in claw. It's our being able to reflect upon what's going to happen. No, no, um, no group of pigs has invented its own national health service. But we, you know... This group of pigs has. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, because we can see that it's socially the, the, cohesive. The, the antisocial person who rejects the values that you're suggesting isn't on this view doing anything objectively wrong. He's just going contrary to the social mores that have developed. But there isn't any sort of binding nature on this. Uh, these social mores apart from what the people themselves think. That's, that's why they're so different in different parts of the world. Exactly, uh, and that, 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 land, yeah, yeah, that, that lands us in socio-cultural relativism, as I said. Without a transcendent foundation, but one the, culture's the people, values the, the, are just as good as another's. But people in Saudi Arabia would think that there is another transcendental reason for cutting off people's hands, whereas you don't. And I would... In be inclined on, right. to be on your side in these good. matters. <laughs> good, but then on an atheistic view, it's very difficult to see why these 
Islamic radicals are wrong. They just have a different... Uh, because, no, I, I, well, I, I, if I were to try to summarize my own uh, modus operandi, it would be that I do not want to inter inter um, obtrude into the lives of others. I don't want to quench other people's aspirations, would be better uh -huh. put. Now, I agree that leads you into all sorts of questions about universalism, because I think it was probably quite good of me, actually, to have interfered in the life of Adolf Hitler. Yes. Um, so I do draw the line somewhere. But on the whole, I think a good way of getting through life is not to thwart the aspirations of others. That's what you think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he thwarted uh, a lot of aspirations. Yeah. Uh -huh. Fine. Right. Uh, looking at my watch, it's uh, really unfortunate that we don't have uh, more time to extend uh, this interesting conversation, but perhaps it, it is nice that we ended on something of a note of a agreement about the view on at least one premise of one of the arguments that have been covered this evening. Um, thank you very much to you and thank you very much to our debaters.